Good afternoon. I'm Jessica Warren. I'm the Agriculture Natural Resources Agent and County Extension Coordinator in Camden County. And I'm going to be talking to you today about welcoming pollinators to your landscape. This presentation is part of the University of Georgia Extension Services Georgia Green Landscapes Program, which is funded in part by a grant from, their, from the Center for Urban Agriculture. These guidance series will help Georgia residents to create certified, sustainable Georgia landscapes um, with the goal of protecting our natural resources for future generations. So why are pollinators important? Um, I think we all probably know by now there's a fair amount of, of hype in the recent years around pollinators. They've always been important. We just haven't been paying attention as much until recently. So 80% of plants rely on animal pollinators for survival. In Georgia, the annual value of pollination is over $360 million a year. So pollinators play a vital role for our native wildflowers and trees and shrubs, but also a lot of the horticultural crops that we produce. So this is things like apples and peaches and blueberries, tomatoes, watermelons um, that we grow here in Georgia, but also other things that you enjoy like coffee need pollinators. So there are a number of different types of pollinators. Um, what we think of most often are things like bees, honeybees in particular, which aren't actually native, but are a good pollinator. Um, that's what usually kind of gets the most attention pollinator wise. But we also have flies that are wonderful pollinators and important pollinators, as well as wasps. Um, butterflies are pretty well known because they're pretty charismatic, but moths and beetles also do a lot of pollination. And in addition to that, outside of the insect world, we also have things like lizards and frogs and mammals, um, small mammals that do a lot of pollination, especially in different areas. So just a few of the bees that you might see. I mean, we're focusing today on things that are native to Georgia, of course. So um, there are tons of species of um, bees, as well as the other insects that we'll talk about. And we're just showing a few of them to show a little bit of the diversity that you may see. And that a bee is not always what you think it might be. You'll see the same thing with flies and wasps. It may not always be what you're expecting it to look like. So um, on the left here, we have the longhorned bee. You can see he's got some um, baskets on his legs that collect pollen. Then we have the green sweat bee, metallic green sweat bee over here in the upper right, um, which is one of our prettier bees, I think. They're not always popular because they will be, sometimes they will land on your skin to lap up some sweat and get some salts from you. Um, and if you move or pinch them, they will sting. Um, it's not a terrible sting by any means, but they're a, a good important native pollinator that we have. Also, you can see at the bottom there are um, leaf cutter, mason bee, and these are just a few of the different species that we have out of many. Um, our flies don't always look like flies. So some of the things that you see and, and think maybe, um, I know this hoverfly on the bottom left, um, a lot of times it gets mistaken for a yellow jacket. Um, the bee fly, of course, mimics a bee, so a lot of people make that mistake as well. Um, and then we also, we have several other species of hoverflies. Um, we have the tachydnid fly, the califorid fly. So we have a lot of different types of flies other than what we normally picture as a fly, which for most people is probably either a house fly or a horse fly, not something they really wanna see around. But flies can do a really important job pollinating. They're not quite as good of pollinators as bees are. Bees are gonna be the best in the insect world simply because their bodies were created just to move and hold pollen, essentially. They feed on nectar, but also they have these hairy bodies that collect the pollen to take back to their nests. Um, and that's gonna make them a little bit more efficient pollinators, but our other, pollinate, other pollinators are very important just as well. So wasps aren't always the most popular category of pollinators that we have, but you can see that there's a great variety of wasps here. And one thing to note about wasps is A, they don't all sting. Most will only sting if they're protecting a nest, but some of these are solitary nesters, so it's very rare for them to sting. Um, and another thing that's important is wasps are often an important predator 
to a lot of pest insects that we have in the landscape. So a lot of insects we don't want around or that are causing damage in our landscapes or gardens. Um, some of our wasp species will either feed on those, capture them to um, put them in the nest to feed their larvae, or some of them are actually parasitoids of those pests um, and they help keep those populations in check that way. So there's a number of different wasps on here. My favorite is the potter wasp because even though they do make a little bit of a mess, they make these amazingly articulate nests that are these perfect little pots like it sounds like. Um, they're really neat wasp to watch, but we have a number of really cool and unique um, insects and wasps in particular that will work in our natural landscapes. Beetles, I don't think, get thought about a whole lot as far as pollinators go, but beetles are also an important pollinator um, in our landscapes. So these are just a few examples. You may have seen the soldier beetle in your landscape um, or the lady beetle. There's a few that are a little maybe lesser known or lesser familiar, like the longhorned beetle and the tumbling flower beetle. But there's a variety of beetles um, that, that help play an important role as pollinators in our landscape, as well as other roles. All right, so we've taken a brief glimpse at what some of our native pollinators are, and that's just, like I said, a glimpse of it. Um, but now let's go into a little bit of, if we're wanting to welcome those pollinators into our landscape, what do they need? So we're talk what we're gonna look at is building habitat, and the habitat needs that are true for, for pretty much any organism, um, and especially wildlife or pollinators, are gonna be food, water, shelter, and space. So food, none of us like to go without it. Um, for our pollinators, this could be a variety of things. And really it all comes down to having a diverse ecosystem in our landscape. So having some bare soil. Now I know a lot of us love lawns and don't wanna have any bare soil around, but having a bare spot of soil is really good for your overall wildlife and pollinator habitat for a number of reasons. And we'll keep going back to this. Bare soil provides mineral salts. Um, it can provide moisture um, for a lot of our ground nesting bees and solitary bees. It also provides a nest building site for them to complete their, their life cycle. So bare soil can be an important component. It doesn't have to be a huge area of bare soil, but having some sparse areas and bare soil areas around um, is gonna give you more diversity in the pollinators that you're seeing and supporting. Another important thing is having nectar year round. So having a variety of plants that bloom at different times, um, you can achieve this best with native plants and native plants are gonna provide the best nutrition um, for your pollinators. And they're also gonna be most likely to be host plants and can be host plants for more different species of pollinators, native pollinators. So having um, nectar and pollen year round or as close to year round as possible. Um, Insects. So we don't always think of insects as a positive thing, but insects are the base of the food chain a lot of times. So as I mentioned with those wasps, it's also true with a lot of these other pollinators that they may either feed on insects directly or capture insects to put into their nest for their larvae to feed on when they hatch out of eggs. Um, this is true with a lot of our um, nest or solitary nesting bees or mason bees. Forage for the young. So that may be a host plant like up here um, on the upper left, you see the Gulf fritillary caterpillars that are feeding on the passion vine there. So having that pa passion vine, again, one of those host plants um, available for them to forage on. Um, and then as I, as I mentioned already a little bit, having diverse sources of forage and nectar. So having plants that flower at different times, having plants um, some that are evergreen, some that are deciduous, different shapes and colors and forms. And this also helps as far as a nectar source goes. Um, if you think about it, bees and flies are gonna have really short tongues, whereas things like butterflies and moths are gonna have a long proboscis. Um, you can think of it like a salvia flower that has a kind of a deeper tube to get into. That's gonna be great for a hummingbird or a moth, but it may not be quite as good for a bee um, or a fly where something maybe like a cone flower or a blanket flower, um, 
that will be a little easier for a bee or a fly to feed on um, and not as easy for something like a butterfly or a hummingbird. So we all need water to survive and our pollinators are no different. So that's the next ha habitat need that we're gonna talk about. Um, there's a variety of ways to provide moisture or water for pollinators. And the best thing is most of them aren't something you have to actively manage or do. So you don't have to have a bird bath, but that is one thing that you could use if you already have a bird bath, putting a rock in it or on one side of it, creating a basically a shallow area where a pollinator can perch or stand and get some water without the risk of drowning. Um, this can also be accomplished by a shallow plate. I've seen some people who've gotten like a, a plate from a, an actual dinner plate from a thrift store and incorporated that into their landscape. Um, another thing can be rocks, especially things like flagstones that have some natural dips or cupping in them um, or crevices that will hold water when it rains. Um, bare soil, again, is going to be helpful for that. I think most people at some point have seen butterflies and moths um, getting water from wet bare soil when it's available. Um, another thing, puddles, areas that puddle, which is not always popular in the home landscape, but that's an easy natural way to have water available for pollinators and other wildlife. And then also if you've got some plants in the landscape that have cupped leaf shapes or leaves that will hold some water, um, that will help as well. So our next habitat need to discuss is shelter. Um, I think we all like to have that as well. So there's a number of things you can do to provide shelter. And in general, the best things are the things that occur naturally in nature or mimic what occurs in nature. So log piles, um, this is a good, a good source or, you know, and it may also be a down tree that's out of the way and you can just leave there to decompose. That provides shelter for both pollinators and wildlife. And the special thing about that is that as those um, logs or that wood starts to decompose, it also produces heat. So in addition to providing shelter, it provides some warmth um, for animals and pollinators that are trying to get through the winter. Another is rock walls or piles. Those provide good shelter. They can also help hold in a little bit of heat there. Um, pithy or woody stems. So uh, I have a pollinator bed at my house and what we do with anything that has a woody stem is about this, about January, um, I was about to say this time of year, but you may not know when you're viewing it, what time of year it is when I made it. So, and around December, January, when everything's kind of died back, I go in and I cut all the woody stems to about 12 to 18 inches above the ground so that that can be used for habitat um, for solitary nesting bees and other organisms. It doesn't really impact the look or the health of the plant. It just helps provide better habitat. Bare soil, again, um, for especially for our ground nesting bees as well as some other insects um, that we want around. And then another option is the insect hotels or um, bee hotels, you may hear them called, and they can be a great resource. There are some, um, there are some, this, there's some research or some thought that they may not be the best solution just because A, um, you're putting a whole lot of individuals very close together where they wouldn't normally be, which may lead to more disease among the population. Or, and also B, that um, you may be creating a buffet for predators. So those are just some things to keep in mind. Um, it's not to say that insect hotels by any means are bad. They can be a great way um, to incorporate some more habitat into your landscape, especially if you don't have a lot of space or options with your space. But my first resort would always be to kind of create these more natural habitat um, resources if possible. So another habitat need um, in addition to shelter is structure. Um, and part of this is because it provides shelter, but um, having some vertical vegetation layers. So basically just not having all of your landscape be at one height. Um, you can kind of see in this picture of the landscape at the top, um, there's trees, mature trees, uh, understory trees and shrubs, um, there's herbaceous things that are low and close to the ground and some that are waist high. So there's a variety of different plant structures, plant heights, 
um, leaf types, flower types, that kind of thing can offer more shelter. It can offer more food. It's just all around um, gonna offer a better habitat for your pollinators. Having some overgrown areas for protection. Um, again, that comes back to that structure. And this may look different in every landscape and what options are available to you. Stumps, snags, logs, and brush piles. So um, snags, if you're not familiar with that term, are trees that have died but are still standing. Now, you know, using your best judgment there, depending on where you live, it may not be safe to have a snag depending on where it is. Um, I have several wooded acres around my house, so most snags are not near my home. If they fall, they're not going to injure anyone or anything. Um, but snags are a great source of habitat, both for pollinators and wildlife, um, which we'll talk about more in the wildlife talk. Logs and brush piles, as I mentioned, provide structure, shelter, and warmth um, in the winter time. And leaving the leaves. So, um, I think there's a little bit more knowledge going around about that now, but um, the leaves that fall in the autumn and usually naturally would stay on the ground until they decompose provide shelter. Um, they also provide warmth and um, they're critical for a lot of species, not just pollinators, but also some um, amphibians and um, other organisms to to either overwinter in or to complete their life cycle. Um, so weaving the leaves, if you can, either where they fall or raking them into an area where they can be left alone for the winter, um, that's a helpful habitat uh, practice. Also having some warming areas. So insects are cold-blooded or ectothermic. Um, they're going to need some open flat surfaces to sun in. You can see that this butterfly on the bottom is sunning on a, a nice small rock. It doesn't have to be anything huge or any great addition to your landscape. Just having some open areas with some flat surfaces that they can warm on. Stones and flagstones are perfect for this. All right, so now we'll talk a little bit about another habitat need that may not get addressed quite as much, but it's safety. Um, the biggest thing as far as safety goes is pesticide use or the lack thereof. So if you're wanting a pollinator friendly landscape, which you should, um, it'll be a healthier landscape, avoiding pesticides whenever possible. Um, this and you can avoid pesticides as much as you want, depending on what you're willing to do. Um, there's no reason you couldn't avoid them completely if you were comfortable doing that. Um, I work with a, a large range of clients and I know people who have all different kinds of comfort levels as far as what they'll accept in their landscape and won't. But um, insecticide, not just insecticides, but also herbicides and fungicides are known to have negative effects against pollinators and bees. Um, so, you know, if you can't avoid it, that's the best practice. If you are going to use something, using something that's less toxic, like um, something that's non-systemic, that's a contact insecticide like horticultural oil or inse insecticidal soap, and you're actually having to spray it on what you're seeing, that would be uh, preferred. Um, also, if you're having problems with something like caterpillars, you could use BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, um, that only is going to affect those caterpillars. So, you know, taking those things into consideration. I will say a note on caterpillars, though. Um, I have a lot of complaints about caterpillars, but then people really want pollinators. So always think about, you know, the thing that may be causing you a problem now, maybe something you want around later. So um, usually the damage that, that most insects and caterpillars do, it looks bad, but it doesn't usually kill the plant. Um, you know, there are different situations, but keeping that in mind of, of what things become. If you are gonna apply any pesticides, never apply anything during bloom. So whatever you're applying to, make sure it is not blooming. It's never acceptable to, to spray during a bloom. Um, if you are going to apply, um, like say to your lawn, you want to mow your lawn before you apply any pesticides um, just to get rid of any weed flowers that may be attracting pollinators, so you'll reduce their exposure. If you are applying anything, sprays are preferred to dust or powders. Um, if you can get different formulations, like for instance with 7, I know you can get liquid 7 or you can get 7 dust. 
So liquid seven would be a better option, even though that's, that's gonna be a very broad spectrum, toxic to all your pollinators chemical, but if you're using it for some reason, using a spray would be preferred. Um, dust and powders are incorporated into the pollen stores that they then take back to the nest and give to the larvae. Um, so it's more likely to cause damage to more individuals and to the whole nest, perhaps. Another thing that's important that I see a lot of issues with is diagnosing the problem or the pest accurately before applying any type of treatment. So I have a lot of clients that come in and say, I have this issue and I've applied all these things. They tell me a laundry list of things that are usually totally inappropriate because say they have a fungus and they've been applying um, insecticides and herbicides. So getting the problem properly diagnosed, and that's something that your local extension office is there for. If you're having an issue in the landscape and wondering what to do about it or how to treat it and wanting to, to deal with it, call or email your local extension agent and do it before you do any treatment. Um, get their advice and their help. They're there to help you diagnose that problem. There's no charge for that. Um, and to make a recommendation of what's appropriate for, to you, for you to use. If you do apply something, make sure that you're using the right formulation and rates. So we tell people all the time, the label is the law. Um, if you're applying it differently than what is on that label, then not only is it technically illegal, um, you may do more harm than good. So if you're applying um, more atrazine to your lawn than what is recommended, it may burn your lawn or damage your grass. It also may cause harm to you because it's only safe if it's used as it's written on the label. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> um, make sure you're using low toxicity and selective formulations whenever possible. You want to avoid things that are systemic, so taken up into the plant because that will also be translocated into the nectar and pollen stores. Um, so again, going back to this contact um, products if possible, and avoid things that are broad spectrum, because that's going to, um, say if you're using a broad spectrum insecticide like seven, um, that's going to attack a number of things or affect a number of things, number of different species, not just the species you're trying to target. Um, as I mentioned, follow the label directions. Another thing is to be cautious of drift. So a lot of times it may not feel windy out to us, but there's enough of a slight breeze that it spreads that mist or that spray that you're putting out onto something that you didn't intend to get treated um, or injured in a lot of cases. If you are going to apply pesticides, make sure you apply them in the late afternoons or evenings when pollinators are less active. All right, so another thing that we can do um, is plant selection. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but native plants are going to offer the best nutrition to native pollinators and the best habitat. And there are a lot of pollinators that are dependent on a certain plant in order to complete their life cycle or to raise their young or to lay their eggs. Um, so again, we're looking for a variety of natives if possible so that we can promote that year round bloom or as close to your round as possible. And make sure you're planting things that are suited to your landscape. Now, if you're planting things that are native to your area, this shouldn't be so much of an issue, but make sure that you're selecting things for the appropriate drainage and sunlight and soil type that you have in your area and hardiness zone, of course, as well. Um, again, if you're planting things that are native to your area, those shouldn't be as much of an issue to worry about. So um, we have several slides that are just some list of native perennials um, to help get you started on some good pollinator habitat and things that help welcome uh, pollinators into your landscape. Um, so we've got a number of different things on here from uh, Jack in the Pulpit to Eastern Columbine, um, Black Cohosh, Doll's Eyes, Wide Leaf Blue Aster, Rue Anemone, so there's a number of different things um, that you can, you can look at. You can also access these lists through the PDFs on our website as well, um, or you can go back through this presentation and pause and look at the list. We've got another list here. Um, and these two, uh, I think there's one more as well, are for spring bloom. 
So um, this is how they're organized as far as spring bloom or summer bloom. And this will vary some um, also depending on where you live in the state. So for my, my area, um, there are some things will have bloom in the spring and they may bloom again in the fall, depending on what the weather's like, or um, that bloom a little later in the year, or earlier in the year than say in North Georgia. So we've got a number of things on here from partridge berry and woodland phlox to dwarf crest, crested iris to dimpled trout lily. So there's um, a variety here. Um, you can see on these lists as well, it gives you a little bit of cultural information as far as light, partial shade, full sun, partial shade, or shade, and um, how big the plant gets and the drainage um, or moisture that it prefers. Another spring blooming perennials list. Uh, this one has fire pink and Indian pink on it, bloodroot, which is a, a nice ephemeral, um, foam flower, some of the trilliums, um, which are all really nice if you live in an area that you can grow those. And it's also nice that these lists give you the flower color over to the right as well. That may help you some in your planning or what kind of aesthetic you're looking for. All right, so here are some native perennials for summer bloom. Um, you know, some of these you may be familiar with and some maybe not as much. A cardinal flower, blazing star, um, bergamot, creeping phlox. So there's a number of different options as far as different bloom times and color um, to be suited to your individual landscape. And here are some native perennials for fall bloom. Um, I have a number of these in my landscape. And in fact, we very recently re-landscaped the front of our extension office with native plants. And part of the goal was to have things that bloomed at different times, just like we would want in a home landscape. Um, so we've got, we've actually got Blazing Star, an obedient plant out there. Um, we also have Swamp Sunflower in our um, stormwater bioretention cell. All right, so a few resources that may help you. Um, coastal Wildscapes is a, a good nonprofit if you're in the coastal area, but they have some good plant lists. Um, but Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant has a great tool, the Native Plant Search Engine, where you can search for natives that have different qualities um, and put in your landscape needs as well. So that's a great tool to go back and use. There's also a great book that does focus more on the coastal area, but a lot of, they have some lists that apply beyond that. Um, this fire adaptive landscaping book, which is about fire adaptation, but they have great native plant lists in there that I um, refer my clients to a lot. All right, so our checklist items for pollinators are providing food for pollinators, bare soil, diverse sources of forage, and nectar year round, pollen, insects, and native plants. Provide areas that collect water puddles, rocks, bare soil, leaves, large rocks, bird baths, or a shallow dish. Dish. Remember if you're doing a bird bath to put um, a rock or a brick or something in there so that they can have a shallower area to access. Provide habitat with shelter, locks, I'm sorry, logs, rock walls, piffy wood stems or woody stems, bare soil or insect hotels. Provide habitat with structure, vertical vegetation layers, trees, shrubs, ground cover, overgrown vegetation, stumps, logs, brush piles, leaves, stone surfaces. Use pesticides wisely, if you must. Diagnose the pest correctly before treatment, follow the label directions, Use low toxicity and selective formulas. Use the correct formula. Use sprays instead of powders or dust. Mow the lawn before applying. Avoid broad spectrum application. Um, prevent drift. Do not apply during bloom and spray in the late afternoon or evening. So if you have any questions about this presentation or this topic, feel free to shoot us an email at georgiagreen at uga.edu or you can check out our website. There are also um, PDFs of these presentations available there if you wanna look back at the material or the list, but you don't wanna go through the video again, um, you're welcome to view that there as well.